Just the facts, just the evidence, sort of Joe Friday. And I can tell you what we've been telling you to do, unfortunately, and it's been working pretty well. We're driving down rates of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, um, but we haven't had as much evidence for it as we would have liked. So here are my disclosures. So let me tell you the main, uh, main conclusions that I would have come to if we were still under ATP3. And with the update in 2004, this is the document that's still out there. It's like JNC7. And what I can tell you is that statin therapy is first-line therapy for lowering LDL cholesterol. Statins have been clearly clinically proven to reduce cardiovascular disease events at all levels of baseline LDL cholesterol. Based on ATP3, after achieving a 30 to 40 percent reduction in LDL cholesterol, regardless of the baseline, the LDL goal should be less than 100 in those with vascular disease or the highest risk people less than 70. And that's a therapeutic option you have. So it's all based on risk. And in, J and in ATP3, the Adult Treatment Panel Lipid Guideline, there are goals. Less than 100, less than 70. Statin therapy modestly increases the risk of diabetes. This is the reason we're not going to put statins in the waters of our city. But the benefits outweigh the risk in those at risk. So it's going to take a clinician like yourself to decide if the patient should be on a statin because there are off-target effects for mechanisms we don't quite know why, but statins like niacin are diabetogenic. They're more likely to cause chemical diabetes. They're like thiazide type diuretics. Lower blood pressure, thiazides improve outcome, but you've got to watch the glucose, and the same is true here. Once a patient reaches their LDL goal, you've determined the LDL goal. The non-HDL cholesterol is an important predictor of residual risk and should be calculated and addressed when the triglycerides are greater than 200. Now that's an ATP3 recommendation. How many of you currently are calculating non-HDL on all your dyslipidemic patients after you address LDL? Raise your hand. Not many. Many of you are not. Okay. Very, very good. Very interesting. So here are the drugs. Let's make it simple. These are the drugs that reduce LDL cholesterol. Statins, bile acid resins, bile absorption inhibitors, the only one out is azetamide, and plant sterols, plant stanols. In terms of the triglyceride and HDL altering drugs, we have fibrates, we have niacin, and we have fish oil. So this is a very easy way to kind of look at the major things that the drugs do, although as you all know, niacin also lowers LDL as well as lowers triglycerides and raises HDL. So these slides are all in your handout. You can refer to them later, but um, this is a starting point. Okay, so ATP3, this is a 2002 document. It's 11 years since we've had the ATP Adult Treatment Panel 3. And what did they say? They said that LDL cholesterol is the primary target of lipid modifying therapy. They said that non-HDL is a secondary target in patients with triglycerides 200 or greater. And the goal is 30 above the LDL. If the LDL goal was less than 70, this is less than 100. If it was less than 100, this is less than 130. HDL, there's no treatment goals. HDL, we know that it's a risk factor, a predictor of risk. However, we have no evidence that treating it or raising it improves outcome. Triglycerides, also observed epidemiologically to be associated with atherosclerotic coronary vascular disease at a level of 500 or greater. It's much greater for its risk of pancreatitis than atherosclerotic coronary vascular disease, but it's a minor lipid player in that we have no clinical trials that primarily address triglyceride reduction and showed outcome improvement. I'm going to talk to you about outcome improvement. What does the evidence say? Just the facts. So in ATP3, it was LDL and non-HDL. We've got so much evidence for LDL reduction. LDL cholesterol is the primary modifiable lipid risk factor. So here's where we've been. Here's where we are. Many of you in the audience are old enough to remember the adult treatment panel one, where the goal was less than 130. Then we moved to 1993, five years later. The goal was less than 100. Now we've moved to the very high risk. This is the therapeutic option of less than 70. This is the type 2 diabetic 
This is the patient with an ACS. This is the patient who's had an MI and chronic kidney disease with or without diabetes. And here's where we are with the ADA. This is the last guideline we had. The ADA, the goal for their diabetics were less than 100, but if they had underlying cardiovascular disease, overt, we knew it, they presented it sometime with something that was atherosclerotic, the goal was less than 70. In pink are the secondary intervention trials. These are people with underlying atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. They've had a stroke, they've had an MI, they have peripheral vascular disease. In blue are the people that have no underlying disease, like I'm sure most of you in this audience. And the question is, does it behoove us to put people on a statin to improve their outcome? And this is the percent that have a cardio coronary heart disease event, and one thing is very clear. If you were a Las Vegas odds maker, you would put your money much more on secondary intervention, where the slope of the line is much more steep, than primary intervention, where the number needed to treat is much greater than the number needed to treat here. Once a person already has an underlying event, there's no question they need statin-based therapy. And a number of trials have shown with different reductions in LDL at certain doses of statin, the outcome is improved. And we also have primary prevention trials, which now extend to men and women, younger and older than age 70, where in high-risk primary prevention patients, and that's the big thing, how do you determine risk in a primary prevention patient who may all have the same LDL, you all look very similar to me. There's a lot of you know, homogeneity in this room. How do I determine with no underlying vascular disease who's at greater risk in this audience? Who's gonna get a greater benefit? How can I reduce my number needed to treat and improve my number needed to harm? That's the real seminal question in the decisions we make day in and day out in our practice. So ATP4, which is coming out soon, is going to ask similar, simple questions like blood pressure. It's not going to be as, it's going to be long, but it's not going to be as, you know, answering everything you might have wanted to know because there's not evidence on everything you wanted to know. What's the impact of the statin on efficacy and safety? What's the role of other drugs to help lower LDL cholesterol? So here are the statins. I mean, if I was on Survivor and they told me I could only bring one, one drug to the island, I know Dr. Pell and I would both bring a statin. I mean, they're the greatest pharmacologic advance for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease since I've been practicing, in my opinion, but you still gotta know who to give it to. You can give it to a lot of people, it'll never help them because they're at low risk. So you gotta be able to know who will benefit. So should all of us reach into the sample closet and take a statin every day? Controversial question. We don't put it in the water. We don't put it over the counter like they do in England because we know there are off-target effects. They have to be monitored. We're not too worried about liver function. But can you imagine if everyone could get access to this at the higher doses, they, they would develop some liver function abnormalities because they're drinking, they have steatohepatitis, blah, blah, blah. That's why it takes a clinician to do it. That's why we make these decisions. But lip, uh, statins really do everything we want. Two important points about statins. The more LDL reduction you get and the longer you're on the statin, the more you reduce vascular events. As opposed to blood pressure, <clears throat> there is no danger in lower. We don't know if it's beneficial. It may cost more to do it, but we don't have any danger signal if you reduce LDL lower and lower and lower. But the incremental benefit may be very, very small. Different than blood pressure, where lower may be harmful. The duration and the amount. We have a number of trials where we were able to show benefit. And these were mainly secondary prevention in the highest risk people. They had coronary disease, they had peripheral arterial disease, they already had a stroke. That's a no-brainer. You see a patient post ischemic stroke, you see a patient with claudication, you're gonna put them on a statin. You're remiss not to. But high risk primary prevention, that's the challenge. So let's look at some of the recent collaborations. We know from 170,000 patient meta-analysis with 26 trials 
There's no harm in statin therapy other than some of the off-target effects. But if you lower LDL a millimolar, about 40 milligram per deciliter, you reduce <coughs> major atherosclerotic coronary events 22%, CBA 20%, and death 10%. And we do believe the lower the better. But we don't know how much lower that you have to go. <coughs> we do believe most of the benefit of statins is on non-HDL. And as I'll show you in the talk, yes, they lower LDL, but they lower non-HDL. And I will show you that if we would have picked non-HDL as the primary target in all of these clinical trials, <coughs> we would have done better. It would have made life simpler. And I'll show you how simple it is to calculate the non-HDL. The basal LDL it should not be a factor in your decision to use a statin. It's the risk of the patient. Mrs. Jones had an MI. Her LDL is 96. In the heart protection study, she benefited from 40 of simvastatin. And 951 people had an LDL less than 80, and they benefited from no statin. 40 of simvastatin, fixed dose in the heart protection study, benefited these people. So the LDL is not what triggers your wanting to use a statin. It's all about risk. Everyone benefits. There's no subgroup that doesn't. Skin color, age. We have data now that just shows in, in the right risk population, these drugs are very good. There's minimal risk. We don't believe there's any cancer risk. Yes, there's a myositis risk. Patients complain of it, myalgias. But true myositis with CPK elevation, infrequent. We don't check liver function tests now unless there's a clinical indication we get a liver function test six to 12 weeks after we start. We also get one at baseline. We need one at baseline. And six to 12 weeks longer. But then we don't chase LFTs anymore, unless there's a clinical reason to do it. And yes, I'll show you the risk of diabetes. So here's a very important slide. For the same LDL reduction, it's really all about the risk. So here are two patients in your office. The top one is a high-risk patient, and the bottom one is a low-risk patient. In the top one, you reduce their LDL from 220 um, to 190, and the bottom one, 220 to 190. The LDLs reduce 30 in both. But because the top one is at much higher risk for the number of cardiovascular events prevented per 100 people, as opposed to here, you're going to get much more return on your number needed to treat than in this group. So it's all about risk at the same LDL. And in this example, you're, you're thinking about reducing LDL from 100 to 70. Well, in a high-risk individual, you're going to prevent 1.5 cardiovascular events for every 100 people treated for five years. Here, less than 0.4. So if you can identify the high-risk from the low-risk person, you're going to have a better strategy for who you'll have more impact and improve their outcome. Very important. There is no patient that doesn't benefit from a statin. Okay, let me make that blanket statement. However, when you look at the LDL cholesterol reduction, okay, here going from less to more, if the patient's at very low risk, you have very little incremental benefit. You can't reduce events in people that won't go on to develop events. Can you identify this person? On the other hand, if you can identify this person, for the, same, for the same amount of LDL reduction, look at the difference of how much improvement you're going to make in the five-year risk of major vascular events from this huge meta-analysis published in 2012. So it's all about the NNT. It's all about the risk. And at higher risk, okay, you're going to have greater benefit with more LDL reduction than at lower risk where the number needed to treat is much more to prevent one event. So statin therapy reduces the risk for cardiovascular events at all levels of baseline risk. The greater the risk, the greater the benefit. Statins reduce the risk for cardiovascular morbidity and mortality irrespective of the baseline LDL and risk stratification. Statin therapy modestly increases the risk of diabetes, but the benefits outweigh the risks in those at risk. That's why we don't put it in the water and why we as clinicians have to be able to understand the risk of our individual patient. 
Let me just say a couple of things about diabetes. We've known for a long time that niacin is diabetogenic. It abnormally affects glucose tolerance and causes insulin resistance. The exact mechanism is unclear like it's unclear with statins. But we know that about niacin. We also know that now with statins. Now there are two meta-analyses I'm going to share with you. This is a huge meta-analysis, <clears throat> follow-up of four years, and what it says is that there's a 9% increase in risk of insulin diabetes. I call it chemical diabetes. I call it meeting the threshold for diabetes. The glucose goes up. They now are, quote, chemical diabetics. They're not natural diabetics, but the drug, for reasons we're not quite clear, abnormally affects insulin's handling of glucose, and it causes chemical diabetes. There's one additional case of diabetes per 255 patients taking statins for four years. But there's a benefit in outcome, okay? And here you can see that from this JAMA paper in 2011. You get two additional cases of diabetes per thousand treated with high-dose statins. This is the number needed to harm or cause chemical diabetes. It's 498 per year. But there are 6.5 fewer first cardiovascular events. The number needed to do good is 155 per year. So yes, we have to watch for chemical diabetes with statins, especially high-dose versus low-dose a little less likely to occur with pravastatin, fluvastatin, and pativastatin than atorva and rosuva than simva because they're higher potency. The higher the potency, the more the glucose could be affected. So we follow glucose, but it's not a reason not to use statins. The new ATP4 is going to state that there's no benefit from statin-based LDL therapy in patients with non-atherosclerotic associated heart failure. So when they have an idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy where you have or haven't proven that they have normal coronaries and they don't have ischemia, these patients we haven't shown benefit from a statin. Ischemic heart disease does, of course. If they're on dialysis, we haven't been able to show that they benefit, but in the SHARP trial with simvastatin and azetamide together, we have been able to show that stage 3 and 4 CKD have less atherosclerotic disease. We don't really change their renal function, but we improve the number one cause of their death, which is atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So if you're a nephrologist, you're going to use a statin in stage 3 and 4 CKD, but in stage 5, post-transplant or already on hemo or peritoneal dialysis, we don't have good evidence. It's probably too late. We don't know if there's harm either. We just don't know if there's any good. And if you've had a stroke and it's ischemic from carotid or vascular disease in the brain, you benefit. Gosh, you benefit from a statin. But if you've had a hemorrhagic stroke, we haven't been able to show there's a benefit. So here are three populations where a statin hasn't been evidence-based for outcome improvement. Otherwise, they have been. Now here's a new concept. ATP4 is not going to tell you that there are goals for LDL therapy. You are not going to see less than 100 and less than 70. You are going to see goals based on risk and the amount of LDL reduction. So if a drug, if you're at highest risk and studies have shown the benefit was greatest at an LDL of 50% or more, they're going to recommend certain drugs. I'm going to show you this in a minute. If you're at lower risk where you need 30 to 50% LDL reduction based on the clinical trials, other drugs will be recommended. And if you only need a 30%, less than 30% reduction, other statins will be recommended from high potency to lower potency statins. We wouldn't have any dogfight if they were all generic. They're not all generic, but we do have some generics, and one of the generics is almost at the $4 list, and it's high potency. So there are drugs in here that, we, that are cost conscious, that are cost conscious. I want to just say a word about the metabolism of these drugs. I want you to remember ALS, like amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So if you're on a Torva, Lova, or Simba, You've got to watch out for the 3A4 interaction. These are the macrolide antibiotics. These are the azole antifungals. These are the HIV drugs. You don't want to use these drugs if you're going to have 
an HIV patient. So Prava, Pativa, Fluver, these are preferred drugs because they are not, the, a, the HIV drugs are, me, are metabolized through the 3A4 system, so you gotta watch out there. Other statins are used there. So if my patient has myalgias on a torvastatin, the next drug I use will not be Lova or Simba. I will go to a non-3A4 drug to try to get rid of the myalgias. But sometimes you have to play statin roulette, where you just go through all the drugs. And sometimes you sit there with people that have had an MI or have had a bad stroke, and you say, look, every statin I've tried to get you to tolerate, you tell me there's a reason you can't. None of these are life-threatening. I don't want you to be miserable. I do think you'll live longer if you take this drug. But this is your decision, and I document it. I documented it. Sometimes, you know, I, I've had patients that are just not going to take a statin. You know, their mother had some problem with it, and, Doc, I'm not taking it. Don't try to get me to take it. I know you're trying to do good, but I'm not doing it. I'd rather die. Okay, I put it in the chart. No, really. Because nobody's going to come back and look at that chart and say, why did you not have the patient on a statin, Dr. Basil? A couple of words. Because of an increased myopathy risk, the FDA now does not allow us to start new patients on adiosimba. However, if your patient's been on adiosimba and has tolerated it for one year, you can continue it, okay? Um, otherwise, 40 is the ceiling dose of Simba. But fortunately, the heart protection study only used 40. So we have good evidence at 40 for Simba statin. Certain drugs are contraindicated with Simba. Um, that's because they go through the 3A4. These are the azole antifungals. These are the macrolide antibiotics. These are the HIV drugs. They're all in your handout. Now, as a hypertension person, I can't use more than 10 of Simba if they're on verapamil or diltiazem. And hurt me, hurt me, hurt me, I can't use more than 20 of Simba if they're on amlodipine. And I've tried to find out why this is, and I cannot find out why. I do not know the reason, but it's what the FDA says. So in those cases, often I have to use another statin. So you might use a drug like a torvastatin if you need a high-potency statin in those cases. Because I like to use a lot of amlodipine. And my hypertensives, there's got to be a strong reason why they're not on a statin. But some hypertensives may not benefit from a statin. But... Uh, most do. Adherence is a problem. I'll just tell you, you write the prescription, it may be however you do it, and I can tell you, if you see them in six months, you gotta be hoping they're on it. Because these patients stop these medicines. And the adherence rate with statins is awful. And I, I love the EMR. I love the EMR when I e-scribe because it goes right to the pharmacy and someday we're gonna have a system where if the patient doesn't show up in two days, instead of just taking the drug off the shelf, the pharmacist is going to call the patient. The pharmacist is then going to call the clinician. And we are going to get paid for getting that patient back in the office. Now, this is kind of the medical home. But you can't just write a medicine and think they're going to take it. When they don't show up to the pharmacy, like at the VA, when they don't show up at the VA and pick up the drug, somebody's going to get in touch with me because it's a capitated healthcare system. And we don't want to spend your tax-paying dollars on some veteran that is being given the best therapy and just won't take it. We'll do everything we can. The problem is I also now practice in private practice. And I write these medicines. And I have a relationship with the pharmacies locally in Charleston that I write to. I want them to call me if my patient doesn't show up to pick up the drug. I think you should pay be paid for that. It's your time and your energy, but that's another important thing. But the e-prescribing can really help with that. You put them on a statin, you're not quite where you want the LDL to be, 50%, 30 to 50%, less than 30. You can double the dose of the statin. You can switch to a more efficacious or potent statin. You can administer a bile acid resin or azetamide, or you can add another drug. Those are your choices. Let me just show you that, like in blood pressure, you get the best bang for your buck from the initial dose. And each doubling of the dose of a statin only further reduces the LDL 6%. 6%. That's the rule of sixes. So in an effort to get more LDL reduction, or if you're already at the highest dose you can use of the statin, if you add a bile acid resin or a bile absorption inhibitor, you're going to get an 18% reduction with the dose. Because it's a different mechanism of action, rather than just doubling the dose of the statin. So I like bile acid sequestrants. 
I have no problem with them. I've been using them at the VA since 1982. They do nice things to LDL. They work very well with statins. And there's some evidence in primary prevention that they improve outcome in the Lipid Research Council trial. Um, I don't have any dog in this fight, but I will tell you, even though colocevalam is the only one that has an A1C reduction FDA approval, all bile acid resins reduce A1C. When they went back on the Lipid Research Council trial, they saw that the glucose is fall. So we don't know the mechanism. Statins raise glucose, bile acid inhibitors lower, bile acid resins lower glucose, probably from the binding of the absorption of carbohydrates in the gut. All in your handout. Azetamide. We do not have any evidence, as opposed to statins in primary and secondary prevention, and bile acid resins in primary prevention, we do not have any evidence that azetamide, okay, you know it as zetia, we do not have evidence that it improves outcomes. So it's going to be hard for ATP4 to recommend it currently. But it's a bile absorption inhibitor, and once again, it can lower LDL 18%, not 6%, by doubling the statin. And just quickly, let me tell you that here are the bile acid resins, uh, the sequestrants, okay? And they bind bile salts in the gut. By doing so, they tell the liver that we're low on cholesterol and the liver increases the LDL receptors so that it can pull cholesterol into the liver to replace the bile acids. By doing so, you upregulate the LDL receptors, you lower systemic vascular cholesterol, and you have a reduction on top of the statin. The bile uh, absorption inhibitor, azetamide, works at a different area. Okay, it works in the neiman pick enzyme, not important. But you can use an azetamide and a bile acid resin together. Yes, they work by different mechanisms. You can use them together in the statin intolerant person. It hasn't been looked at for evidence base. And the plant stanols and sterols, they work here. Absorption of uh, micellar cholesterol, feedback to the liver, <coughs> similar type process. So, just a word about azetamide. It only comes in a 10 milligram dose, but I can tell you if you split the tablet, like we like to do at the VA, you get almost as much LDL reduction. And as you know, this drug comes in an 80-10 with a statin. And once it goes generic, if you were to break the tablet, you'd have 45. 40 would be the ceiling dose for the simvastatin, and now you have five. What a cost-effective drug. I'm not promoting any particular drug. I'm just telling you a way to get more bang for your buck if the pocketbook is a little tight for your patient. Now, in CKD, we do have one trial that shows that the combination of simvastatin azetamide 2010 compared to placebo in patients a third of whom were on dialysis, a fifth of whom were diabetic, but had a mean EGR of 27. So that would be stage four, some stage three CKD, and also stage five being on dialysis. Look at these lipids. So you have a patient with a GFR of 38. You haven't sent him to a nephrologist yet. These are your lipids. And you say to yourself, should I put this person on a statin? And in this particular, oh, by the way, we have no evidence that azetamide alone improves outcome. So in this particular trial, azetamide with simvastatin reduced atherosclerotic events, the primary endpoint. But please notice, we weren't able to show any benefit in the dialysis patients and two other studies just in dialysis patients and or transplantation patients were not able to show a benefit. So don't wait too long in your CKD patient who may not have any other indication for a statin. In stage three and four CKD, the new guidelines will suggest they should be on a statin. Now, how do we prove that azetamide improves outcome? Well, we can do a study where we take very high-risk people, 
called the Improve It study, post-ACS, regardless of their LDL, but here's what they're going to come in with, and you put them on standard therapy and you double-blindly randomized 18,000 plus patients, this is an ongoing trial, to either Simva-40 or simva anazetamide. If you have a benefit with the azetamibe group on top of Simba, you've proven that azetamibe with Simvastatin is better than Simvastatin alone. Right now in the SHARP trial, you just know that the two together is better than placebo. And this is an ongoing trial that will be concluded next year if you're waiting for azetamibe evidence. Here's the problem. In this group, the LDL has been reduced to 66 in this group, the LDL has been reduced to 52. So if it's negative, you can see the Monday morning quarterback saying the reason it's negative is because there wasn't enough difference or disparity between this group in LDL and that group in LDL. But this is what we've got, the Improve It study, which will put azetamibe on the map or put it a little lower in terms of where we think we use it. ATP4 is not going to say much about plant sterols and stanols because there's no evidence that by using them, outcomes are improved. But in our average diet, we get about 300 milligrams a day. Usually they come from plants or trees. Um, <clears throat> LDLs reduced about 9 to 13%. They're, they're additive to statins, like the bile acid resins, the bile absorption inhibitors. They're well tolerated. The recommended dose is about 2,000 milligrams a day. And these are just some of the ways you can get in products already available, plant uh, stanols and sterols, okay? So not recommending anything, not evidence-based for outcome improvement, but in the patient, especially the statin intolerant patient, there are ways to further LDL reduction outside the normal channels. Question two, what evidence supports LDL goals for primary prevention in those without established vascular disease? So very important slide. ATP4 is not going to tell you to get the LDL down to less than 100 or less than 70. It's going to tell you to get it to less than 50% from baseline, 30 to 50% from baseline, or less than 30% from baseline. But it is going to tell you that if you want to improve outcome based on clinical trials, you should be using this dose of Prava, this dose of Simba, this dose of Rosuva, this dose of Lova, and this dose of Atorva in high-risk primary prevention. And it's going to say that if you're using 20 of Prava, you don't know if you're going to do any good because it was never tested. It's going to go from a paradigm of LDL goals to what drugs were used in a trial of what type of patients that showed an improvement in outcome. It's going to be evidence-based for the statin and the dose used in a particular trial. So what they're saying is if you're sitting out here in the audience and you're at high risk but have no underlying vascular disease, these are the doses of the drugs that they're recommending you have the patient on if you're going to pick these drugs. And they're not recommending any particular drug. This slide from the Jupiter trial shows a very nice thing, and that is that all patients kind of benefit. There aren't enough patients here, but everything's going in the right direction regardless of the LDL at baseline. And that on therapy, here with resuvastatin, 20 milligrams, there was an observation that the lower the LDL, the better. At the very least, it's saying there's no harm in getting the LDL as low as possible. When we're born, our LDL is 25. When we live in this society, our LDL goes up. What you want your LDL at is unclear because I don't know how much benefit there is of getting it 50% reduced from 140 to 70 and then someone else wants to add another drug or two to get it down to 50. I don't know. It's never been tested. How low do you have to be? Where's the optimal benefit? What's the cost effectiveness? Very important questions. But there's no, no, no harm in lowering LDL. There's no floor for LDL that we know of. Certainly no harm. We don't know about best benefit. Just observation. What about secondary prevention? Here are the trials. If you've had an ACS, you went into an emergency room and you had an acute coronary syndrome, clearly, and as you know, a lot of people are starting a atorvastatin at 80. It wasn't tested at 10, 20, 40. It was given as 80 or placebo, and it improved outcome. 
Stable coronary disease from the 4S and the heart protection study. Look at the, this is a reference less than a month old. Simvastatin. <clears throat> Post-MI, you've got two studies with Prava. But a lot of people take 10 and 20 of Prava. They're not evidence-based. 40 is. And post-stroke, Atorva, three different studies. <clears throat> now, let me shift to non-HDL. This is the neglected target of therapy, and this is an ATP3. It was a target of 200 or greater. It may be at 150 in ATP4. Non-HDL is just total minus HDL. You get a total and you get an HDL. You subtract HDL from the total. You have the non-HDL. It measures the cholesterol content of all ApoB-containing lipoproteins. These are all the atherogenic lipoproteins. You don't need an NMR spectroscopy. You don't have to send it off for special testing. You don't have to be fasting. Three o'clock in the afternoon, never saw the patient, get a total and an HDL. Calculate the non-HDL. Predictive value of non-HDL levels for coronary disease is generally similar to the LDL particle number. How many of you are sending off your lipids for NMR spectroscopy for particle number? Honestly, I know people are doing it. None of you are doing it? None of you are sending off lipids for NMR spectroscopy? Okay, I'm fine with that. I got no problem with that. But here's what we're looking at. So here are all the lipoproteins and the APOs below it in blue. Here's the cholesterol to triglyceride relationship in each of these lipoproteins. As you know, there's much more triglyceride in the collamicron remnants in VLDL, about the same IDL, cholesterol, triglyceride, but much more cholesterol in LDL and HDL. You, you know that. Here's HDL. I want to calculate the non-HDL, which has the LDL and all the other atherogenic lipoproteins. And all I do is take the total to get the non-HDL. I take the total cholesterol. That's all the cholesterol. And I subtract HDL. And now I'm left with all the atherogenic lipoproteins, the content of all the atherogenic cholesterol and triglyceride in everything but HDL. It's simple. There's no extra charge. It can be done on a non-fasting specimen. The goal is 30, 30 more than LDL. If the LDL is less than 100, this is less than 130. If the LDL is less than 70, this is less than 100. Now, there aren't going to be goals in ATP4, but this is what was in ATP3. Let me just show you that you'll do better with non-HDL than you will with LDL for coronary risk. Look at the relationship of risk from an LDL of less than 130 to greater than or equal to 160. It's not very steep. However, if you only calculate non-HDL, look at the steepness of the relationship if the non-HDL is greater than or equal to 190, greater than or equal to 160, or greater than or equal to 130 from the Framingham Heart Study. <coughs> Furthermore, if you only had one <coughs> risk strategizer, non-HDL certainly looks in both men and women as good as LDL, <coughs> and it's pretty good from that Framingham total to HDL ratio. Unfortunately, we never used non-HDL as the primary endpoint. We should have. We used LDL as the primary endpoint. Got to be evidence-based, so LDL in the past. But here's the thing. <coughs> in every trial we did, we never double-blindly randomized people to 10 of Simba, 20 of Simba, 40 of Simba, and 80 of Simba to get to different goals. We used one dose, a ceiling dose, and then we looked at all the LDLs and tried to gather where patients did the best. That's not the best science. It has bias, and it can be confounded. That's the problem. We've never looked at all these different doses of drug. You know, the FDA has approved simvastatin at an initial dose of 40 milligrams in type 2 diabetes, in patients with coronary disease, and patients with stroke. There is no FDA indication for 10 or 20 of simvastatin. Now, it's indicated for patients at risk, but not in those particular populations. It's never been studied. Only 40 was studied. Let me just go on with this non-HDL. You're in your office. You see a patient 
with an LDL of 130. Well, you look at these patients, they both have the same LDL. Could they be at the same risk? Well, you do a little bit more, and you find out that the non-HDL is 148 compared to 180. Well, what's making up the higher number in the non-HDL are all these atherogenic lipoproteins that you haven't accounted for until you calculated the non-HDL. It's actually more ApoB, or the LDL particle number. You didn't have to send it off. And why? Because the trigs are high and the HDL is low. Here the trigs are not as high, excuse me, and the HDL is not as low. Here the trigs are high and the HDL is low. What's happening? When you have a disparity, after you get the LDL to gold and the triglycerides and the HDL, <clears throat> even though you have the same LDL cholesterol, it's not very much different, the LDL particle number is much greater. When the triglycerides are high, when the HDL is low, there is a disparity or discordance between the LDL particle number and the LDL cholesterol concentration. The concentration doesn't tell you how many atherogenic lipoproteins are circulating. You would know that if you calculated the non-HDL, because here, if the LDL goal is 160, you're at 180. Here you're at your goal, here you're not. It's because you have a high triglyceride and a low HDL, which you now realize from calculating your non-HDL. So ATP4 is not going to recommend an NMR spectroscopy. It's going to recommend calculating a non-HDL. So who needs advanced lipid testing? Perhaps no one. You all said you weren't using it. Perhaps high-risk patients where you want to optimize therapy. Well, there's no evidence for that. Perhaps patients where there is a discordance between non-HDL and other ApoB estimates. And that's when there is a discordance between the high triglyceride and the low HDL. Where do you see that? Type 2 diabetics. Patients with the metabolic syndrome. Patients with chronic kidney disease. The patients that are obese. These are the groups that have the high triglyceride and the low HDL. So what do you do with the non-HDL? Well, you've already had them on the statin, so what are you going to do? Well, are you going to add another drug? I'm going to show you that we have no evidence for adding a fibrate to the statin currently. We have no evidence for adding niacin to the statin currently. I know many of you do it, but we don't have evidence for it. We don't have outcome improvement. Yes, you can improve the lipids, but in the future, the FDA is not going to improve, approve a drug for what it does to lipids. They want to see outcomes. Because we know from certain drugs, like CTEP inhibitors, where the HDL was increased 130%, patients died sooner because they had an off-target effect with aldosterone, hyperkalemia, hypertension, etc. So lipids are a surrogate marker of benefit. We want hard body counts. We want strokes. We want heart attacks. We want ischemic events. So this is a controversial area. Nicotinic acid is a great drug. It's the universal lipid-lowering drug. It lowers LDL. It lowers triglycerides. It raises HDL. As a single drug, it has evidence for improving outcome before the statin era. We didn't have statins. Nicotinic acid improved outcome. In the coronary drug project, it not only reduced non-fatal MI in patients that had already had an MI, but it also decreased death at 15 years. It decreased death. Nicotinic acid has evidence as a single drug. It doesn't when you add it to something like a statin. That's the problem. So if you have a statin intolerant patient, you have evidence from both the coronary drug project and the Stockholm ischemic heart disease study to use niacin. But if you have a patient on a statin, do you have evidence for adding niacin? Well, you don't. Because two studies have looked at this, and they weren't able to show that adding niacin with a statin on top of a statin as monotherapy improved the outcome. There was no difference. They're superimposable. 
Now, a lot of people feel this was an underpowered study because the trigs weren't as high as they should have been. The HDL wasn't as low as they should have been. But this is the way the study was done. This is the evidence we have. We have another study, too, called the HPS2 Thrive Study. It didn't show any benefit from niacin and a prostaglandin inhibitor on top of a statin to the statin alone. What about fibrates? Fibrates do nice things. They, you know, they're PPAR alpha and PPAR gamma. They're PPAR alpha uh, inhibitors, so they, raise triglyc they, they lower triglycerides, they raise HDL. They also have an LDL effect. And in studies where they've been looked at by themselves in the form of gemfibrozole, they improved outcome. So if you have a statin intolerant patient, you can use gemfibrozole and improve outcome. You can improve outcome both in patients who are primary prevention and in patients who are post-MI from the VA HIT trial. However, if you have them on a statin and they're a type 2 diabetic, you haven't shown any ability on top of a statin to further reduce their or improve their outcome. And you haven't shown any benefit in the ACCORD trial to further improve their outcome. So we're frustrated. You got them on that good dose of a statin. You've driven down their LDL, but they have a triglyceride that's higher than it should be and an HDL that's lower than it should be. They've got a, a, an increase in their non-HDL above their goal. And you're saying, I want to add something to do good. Well, in Accord, there was no cardiovascular benefit. And notice that the LDLs were both reduced and they were similar. Remember I showed you in Improve It, they've reduced that LDL to 66 versus 52. Here, there was no difference in the LDL when you added the uh, phenylfibrate to the statin on top of the statin alone. Is that the reason why there was no difference in the study? So when you consider adding a drug to statin-based therapy, we have no evidence for adding nicotinic acid. We have no evidence for adding phenofibrate. We have no evidence for adding fish oils, although fish oils at one gram post-MI does improve outcome. We have no evidence currently adding a zetamide to a statin, and we have no evidence for or against adding a bile acid resin, including colocevalam, to a statin. It's frustrating. But as Joe Friday would say, them is the facts. That's the evidence. Some of you are going to add these drugs to a statin because in your heart, you believe you're going to do well for the patient. I just hope they don't have any untoward effect because we haven't been able to show a benefit. And this is where we are. If they don't tolerate a statin, use niacin. Use gemfibrozole. You can use these other drugs. Bile acid resins. Before the statin era, they improved outcome. But on the top of a statin, we just can't show it. So what will the ATP4 say? There will not be a shift from LDL. It's still the primary target. We will not see updated guidelines on targets for HDL or triglycerides because there's no evidence. No trial has targeted HDL or triglycerides. And just let me tell you, if you go into your closet and take a sample because your HDL is 22 and you think you're going to improve your outcome, be careful. There's no evidence for that, and we now know it's probably more important to improve LDL particle number than HDL particle number than HDL concentration. Let me repeat that. There's no study that's showing that increasing HDL concentration, what we get in our lab value, will improve the outcome. I think non-HDL will be a secondary target. They're going to re reduce the triglyceride from 200 to 150. ApoB, it's expensive to do NMR spectroscopy. The government is all about minimizing cost if there's no evidence for using a particular technology. I have a sign on my wall for the students, and it says, our technological advances have superseded our knowledge of knowing when to use them. We have great technology. We need to know how to use it. We can all drive to Jacksonville this afternoon and get a total body CT. You will be frustrated with the incidental lomas that they're going to report. And you're going to then be more frustrated because somebody is going to want to do more tests and maybe even a fine needle biopsy on something that you never needed to know. That's the problem with technology. We need to know how to use it. So, give it to me straight, Doc. How long do I have to ignore your advice? Lifestyle is very important.
And we shouldn't be cynical about this. We should, you know, really be committed, try to work with the patients. We need a dietitian. The government needs to bundle dietitians with our care and not charge patients extra fees to see these health care providers that help us help our patients. Maybe in the future I think that's going to happen. So in conclusion, a lot of things to say. Statin therapy is safe with a low risk of myopathy, hepatotoxicity. Statin therapy reduces risk for cardiovascular events at all levels of risk. Statin therapy modestly increases the risk of diabetes, <coughs> but the benefits outweigh the risk in those at risk. Statins reduce the risk for cardiovascular morbidity and mortality equally in diabetics and non-diabetics, <coughs> and irrespective of the baseline LDL cholesterol and risk stratification. Non-HDL is an important risk factor and should be treated after the LDL is addressed. The non-HDL target is the LDL risk stratified target plus 30. I don't think you're going to see that in ATP4. Non-HDL is simple, non-fasting, total minus HDL. You can do it at 2, 3 in the afternoon. They don't have to be fasting. Even if LDL target is attained, non-HDL is an important predictor of residual risk. Why do people that have their LDL at a particular good goal still develop secondary events? We haven't figured that out yet. Lipid lowering is efficacious in patients with CKD. Currently, it does not benefit patients already with end-stage renal disease or post-transplantation. Lipid lowering therapy in CKD patients prevents atherosclerotic events, the number one cause of their death. It does not improve their renal function, it has no effect on their renal function. Niacin does not provide incremental benefit when used as adjunctive therapy in patients already at high risk goals on a statin. A secondary analysis of the AIM high suggests that in patients with high triglycerides and low HDL, niacin may show benefit, <clears throat> but that's a secondary analysis. It's not hard evidence-based prospective randomized double-blind evidence. And with that, I'll stop. So questions, comments? <laughs> Dr. Pell. I don't need the microphone. I make a lot of noise. Jan, have you looked, have you looked at C-reactive protein as a co-contributor in people with hypertension and hyperlipidemia or the combination, and B, it, it, has anybody found a way to lower the, the value of the C-reactive protein as a potential co-contributor to the malady we're looking at? Excellent question. I didn't have time to go into the difference between a risk factor and a risk marker. A risk factor is something that predicts risk, but also when you intervene and lower it or improve it, you can show benefit. Blood pressure is a risk, a risk factor. LDL cholesterol is a risk factor. 25-hydroxyvitamin um, D is a risk marker. There is no clinical trial that has shown that by raising it, you're going to improve outcome. There's observational evidence that in populations that have higher than lower values, people do better, but we've never intervened double blindly and showed a benefit. CRP is the same way. It is a risk marker. We haven't shown that specifically lowering it as a target of therapy, we improve outcome. So ATP4 is going to distance itself from new risk markers. They are going to say something about coronary calcium. It's getting close, but it's not quite ready for prime time in everyone. They will say something about CRP because it was used in the Jupiter trial, but they're not sure where it stands. Statins reduce CRP. Azetamide reduces CRP. Niacin reduces CRP. A number of therapies reduce CRP. Its exact role in where it should be used is evolving. In my own practice, when I'm on the fence and I don't know if I should or should not use a statin, because the LDL is 108 and I'm not sure of risk, I will get a high sensitivity CRP. And like in the Jupiter trial, if it was two or greater, it pushes me over to using a statin. But that's where I use the CRP. And I don't chase it. I don't follow it, because I know it's going to go down when they're on good statin-based therapy. Is there a difference between those in which the, the value does not go down versus those in which the value does go down? So, that so it's an excellent question. We don't have good trial evidence for that, but observationally, when the CRP doesn't go down on a statin, um, there's a problem. There's a problem, and they don't do as well. But that's observational observational. I have a 
comment and a question. Comment is on the uh, CRP, something that I've neglected over the years and started doing now is, you know, bad dental health. Gingivitis contributes to uh, coronary artery inflammation, and that would be a, something you could do to anybody that comes in other than, of course, aesthetics and how good your spouse will look. Uh, let, me, the, let me, can I comment on that? Yeah. So just real quickly, that's an excellent observation. It's supported by the literature, and that is that periodontal disease is a harbinger of inflammatory disease that contributes to cardiovascular disease, and you're absolutely right on that. The question is, if you have someone in, with uh, uh, stage 3 uh, CKD and they go to stage 4 and on the statin, do you stop it or continue it? I, st I, I continue it. Okay. That's what I've been doing. But you mentioned there was no benefit. I guess that's the benefit of adding it. No, no, no. You, no, no, no. You will, as long as they're not on dialysis, uh, the mean was 27, uh, but they could go as low as I think it was in the study 15. Okay. So there was benefit. So I wouldn't stop it. But I would evaluate the renal function a little more carefully, you know, because if their blood pressure is good and everything else is good um, and their protein is not increasing, you know, what's their volume status? What else is going on? Are they taking an NSAID? Other things. It's a, it's a comprehensive approach, yeah. Okay. That's it? Oh, we have a question in the back. And then we only have a few minutes. Gosh, Hi, AFib. My name is Shahala Namur. I'm from Bandrun General, um, internal medicine resident. I have a question. Uh, for ATP3, we used to risk stratify according to Framingham, risk stratification into mild, moderate, moderately high risk, and then uh, the LDL goals. So for now, uh, for ATP4, we're not going to do that, the risk assessment? Oh, no, you're always going to do the risk assessment. Okay. And hopefully there is going to be a fourth uh, paper coming out that will talk about risk assessment. And it's going to have some nice new charts. Oh, no, risk assessment is paramount. But you're not going to be told to get people to specific LDL targets because in the clinical trials, they were never double-blindly randomized to a particular target. What happened was they were double-blindly randomized to a particular drug or placebo or a drug versus another drug. And then after the trial was done, they observed what the LDLs were and what the outcomes were. That's not hard clinical trial evidence of what the goal should be. You need to do a double-blind randomized trial where your population is stratified by the LDL target and show that by getting to the lower target, the outcomes are further improved. We don't have that evidence. Another question. Um, like you said, non-HDL, uh, when the triglyceride is more than 200, we have to target. So first we start, first line is always statin? Because first line, good question. For non-HDL, like LDL, the first target is always a statin. The first therapy is always a statin. Statins do as much good for non-HDL as they do for LDL. The problem is when you get the patient's LDL reduced with a statin, there may be atherogenic lipoproteins that are still there for residual risk. And the trials that we've done, we haven't been able to show that adding additional drugs further improves outcome. That's the frustration. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So we've got a few minutes. I'll just hit some highlights on AFib, because you all would be remiss if I didn't. Or should we call it a morning? Go ahead. Okay. I know there are always people out there that have AFib. 